Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. I had a friend who recently pinged me about an issue that he was having. And so I wanted to scope an entire show based around this conversation because I think it's important and I think it's something that everyone should talk about and learn. He was in infrastructure. He's not really involved in security, but because of his expertise in identity and endpoint management in Microsoft, he was tasked with this escalation to Microsoft based on the issue that his company was having. His security team was having a hard time getting logs for interactions between external managed and unmanaged team users that would chat with internal users. They wanted to find the logs of these chats in between the external users, internal users, and Sentinel didn't seem to be picking it up. He said security copilot couldn't find the events. They tried e-discovery and the chats weren't showing up there either. And so I started asking some questions because I, I wanted to know, first off, that he told me all the, the different ways that they were trying to find these logs, but what was the reason for these logs? You know, it's a security team, so is it an investigation? But it turns out they wanted to get some sort of alerting going through Sentinel or some other tool that when external chats to internal users started behaving suspiciously because they're not blocking any external domains, they're, they want to keep that active so that you can talk with federated you know, domains and, and have that. Um, just like we do at Microsoft, we're able to talk with external domains that are federated with Teams. And so there is a security risk that has, I guess, been highlighted in the news recently where external users can fish internal users through Teams chats. And so this was the whole reason for them that they wanted to find the logs, set up some sort of alerting to prevent phishing through Teams chats. So now that I had like the whole scope of what they were trying to do, I was like, okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Logs for the external chats. There's a lot of different ways that you can slice this one, but for sure you can accomplish it through a KQL query. I was able to use Copilot to give me one for both chats containing attachments that were downloaded from external users as well as chats containing URLs that were clicked between external and internal users. So very quickly, I was able to just spin up a KQL query. You can toss it into your advanced hunting and find it. But once you have the KQL query, what else can you do with it? Like you could, you know, schedule some sort of uh, schedule query within Sentinel to alert off of it. You could also create a workbook. I think that's probably one of the better uses for it is to create a workbook and then give you an idea. It's more of information gathering of how many chats you're getting from external users that are containing URLs that are actually clicked and then containing attachments that are downloaded, right? But depending on how many you get, I think a schedule query with an alert might be a lot. You might just want to schedule it once a day or you know once every other day. That way you're not getting a ton of alerts and then you can go and check to see what's going on. But a workbook is probably the better use where you can just get a graphical display of a lot of the information. There's also a connection between Teams, Exchange Online, and SharePoint. Adam, do you want to tell our listeners just how the interaction is connected there? Absolutely. So when we're talking about Teams, it's helpful to think of Teams in many ways as a front end to Exchange Online and SharePoint Online. A lot of activity within Teams actually takes place in Exchange Online or SharePoint Online. So for example, one-on-one -on -one chats or even group chats that are outside of a specific team context, just in general conversation, Andy and I talking. That is stored in both of our Exchange Online mailboxes as a conversation. And that's how it can be discovered for e-discovery. That's how it can be held for legal hold and those sorts of things. If I'm talking within a context of a team, so either posting or chatting in a channel as part of a team, 
that is all stored in that team's underlying SharePoint Online um, site that, that was generated when the Microsoft 365 group was created. And so it's all stored in there. So it's important to understand that there isn't really, for the purposes of chats, a team service. There is, but not in this specific case. It's actually stored in those locations. So that's helpful to understand that architecture. Absolutely. So once you understand that, and then you have the KQL query, you can figure out where those logs are. Definitely for e-discovery, there should be a way to find every single team's chat that there is. The other thing that was part of the entire scope that I wanted to highlight was the security team wanted to alert off of chats that started to behave suspiciously between external and internal users. And I didn't really understand what they meant by suspiciously. And that's something that I would ask, you know, again, my friend here wasn't part of the security team. He was tasked with this. So he's reaching out to me for some advice, some help, but for the security team, I would ask, okay, what do you mean by suspiciously? Like, is it suspicious if they just put a link in there? What's the language that they're using that might be suspicious that you want to try to alert off of? And so it can be difficult to create an alert based on some sort of machine learning if you're not exactly sure what you're looking for. So again, maybe you consider a URL from an external user suspicious. Maybe you consider an attachment from an external user suspicious. Those you can alert off of, but there is another way that you might be able to inspect the contents of the chat and alert off of that. Adam, do you want to tell our users or our listeners a little bit about communication compliance? Yes. Communications compliance is a component of the insider risk management suite inside of the compliance suite in Microsoft 365. And the concept is to use machine learning algorithms to detect different types of insider risk. Examples would be things like bullying, offensive language, uh, or threats of workplace violence as a couple of examples. And this works across all the different communications channels in Microsoft 365. So it can work across not only chats inside of Teams, but also things like email as well. And so if you're already an E5 customer, you own this. If you have compliance E5, you own this. There's a couple of different ways to get it, but the concept here is using pre-built and battle-tested ML algorithms to help you detect those kinds of chats. Now, as far as I know, there isn't one that's going to specifically alert on, this looks like phishing. However, it is helpful in those other use cases. And as Andy mentioned, you can certainly alert off those other things. I would say I'm suspicious of how much value you would get out of generating those alerts. Let's say I'm external to a company where Andy's working and we're having a legitimate conversation and I send Andy a link to say, hey, look at this web page and Andy clicks it. It generates alert. What are you going to do with that? Every single alert, are you going to go knock on Andy's door and say, hey, did you click this link? What was it? I, I don't think that's scalable. We're not doing this for email today. And I think that's where we're going to take this conversation is to say, is this really a novel attack vector or is it an extension of an attack vector we're already familiar with and we've already built defenses around? So yeah, we can and talk that, about that more in a moment. That brings up another point that I wanted to highlight is when you talk about scalability, you talk about exceptions sometimes. and when you're alerting on something like this, you talked about value add -on. and maybe you could create a scheduled query alert that would exclude certain domains that you are working with on a daily basis. But I would really caution against, you know, what the industry considers an allow list or, you know, an exclusion list in your domains for protections. There's places within Exchange Online, which in, within Defender for Office, within other email systems where you can exclude certain domains from protection or bypass 
the filter or whatever. Really be careful with that. There are some where I'd be okay, like bypassing, say, maybe the spam filter. But when you completely exclude a domain from all protections, you will open yourself up to possibly like a supply chain attack where someone else gets compromised and then they can send you and they bypass all of your stuff. So if you really wanted to do zero trust, you would try to scope those domains down and not have any at all. I've talked to some customers where I've, they've had issues with spam and phishing and then I go and look at their allow domain list and it's you know 500 different domains and that's just way too many. So. Um, I would caution against that. And that's maybe that's a way to scope it and like scale it, but you know, take that with a grain of salt and be very cautious there. Well, and, and outside of even alerting, just to pull back for a second, there is a setting where you can configure what external domains are allowed to interact with your users through Teams. And most organizations do not have that wide open. They have some sort of approval process where you have to manually request and have a trusted partner domain added so that you can federate with them inside of Teams and have those external chats with them. And I'd say that's the normal behavior of most organizations. And that's probably a reasonable position to configure it that way. Uh, I'd say of the places I've worked, Microsoft is a bit of an anomaly in that we're wide open and we allow anyone to federate with us. Um, but that's mostly just, again, a scope and scale and speed kind of thing where it's, it's just unmanageable. And at one point when I first joined the company, we had like a form you could fill out and you could literally just plug in a domain and it would go added to, and this was still when we were using Skype for business to federate with external domains, but there was no real approval. It was just automation to plug it in the allow list. So that's at least one step you can take is instead of having it wide open, have some sort of ticket approval process to add partner domains as needed for companies you work with regularly. And, and I'm supportive of that. I think that's at least a good step if you want to lock this down a little more. But understand that that's not something every org can do. Let's talk about some of the protections mm -hmm. against this. So to protect against malicious links, in Teams. Generally, you need some sort of M365 API tool. There are other ways. Maybe your endpoint protection has some sort of network protection where it can block against malicious URLs as you launch them. Uh, Windows has smart screen built in. Obviously, there's also other things within like Defender for Endpoint. But most likely, it's an API generated protection, something like abnormal or checkpoint where it can tie into the API of M365 and then because Teams is M365 and then it'll protect you against the, the launches of the URLs outside of Exchange. It's, it's just all M365. Now, obviously, Defender for Office has this natively built in. And so you can turn this on. Uh, the same thing with malicious attachments. Defender for Office customers will get this natively. It's called Safe Attachments, and then the other part is called Safe Links. And those are the same services that are in Exchange Online, but they extend to the entire Office suite. So it's not just Teams, it's also Word documents, Excel, PowerPoints, so on and so forth. So if you have links there and you're launching them, the API will, you know, you'll see a Safe Link rewrite of the URL as it's launched into the browser. Before you move on, I, I want to add one point there. I know a lot of organizations may have Microsoft 365 E5 today, and you may be an organization that has said, we're ripping out Proofpoint over my dead body or Mimecast or Cisco or insert secure email gateway here. However, your secure email gateway may not extend to these protections. So you can turn these on even if you don't want to use Defender for Office's secure email protection, if you want to extend that protection to all of the domains Andy talked about, Teams, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, Office Documents, you can turn this on and augment your protection from Proofpoint, Mimecast, whomever, uh, with this tool. And you may already own it and may just have it turned off. So I would strongly recommend if you own Defender for Office 365, you turn 
at a minimum this on. And you could even turn it on for email as a second set of eyes on that as well. But for certain, this is a really helpful uh, addition to your security tooling. Yeah. And the reason for that, and thanks for that addition, Adam, is those tools that you talked about, like Mimecast and Proofpoint, those are MX record secure email gateways, right? Mm -hmm. So when an email is sent, it hits the MX record first and it goes through and gets redirected to Mimecast or Proofpoint and then it gets filtered into your inbox. A lot of companies will turn off the native uh, exchange online protection, EOP, for spam because they say, oh, I have Proofpoint and Mimecast to do that. Technically, you could filter it through the spam filter again you know, filter it through Microsoft, but all of this stuff within Teams and Office and and um, Excel, PowerPoint, whatever, those are all API driven, and so that's past the MX record, so it's already been delivered or or outside of you know, it's just part of the M three sixty five service. So, like Adam said, this is great augmentation if you are an E five customer or you own Defender for Office Plan two or what you know one of the the flavors of it that includes it but you want to stay with your other secure email gateway you can absolutely do that and still have this protection education is key in this case phishing in teams and this is going to be a key point that we talk about for the rest of the show as well but phishing in teams is no different than any other phishing it's the same concept it's just through a different medium so the protections of it are pretty much the same other than the fact that you're not seeing it through an email format. And so the same education, you know, take a look at the language that might be sent around the chat. Is it, are there grammatical errors? When you look at the domain, is it exactly what you think it would be? If you have domain rewrite, which is something that I typically recommend turning off, because if someone mouses over it and all they see is, you know, na.safelinks. blah, 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 or proof point, blah, 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 then it's really hard to tell without actually clicking on it. Whereas if you don't have URL rewrite there, when you mouse over something, it'll tell you the URL that it's trying to go to versus the writing that is there. When you click on the link, it'll still launch it through the API and redirect it through the safe links. So that's something that you might want to think about because we often teach users to mouse over the link that's displayed to see if it's matching the words that is hyperlinked. So, you know, same, same thing. Don't click on anything. If you think it's suspicious, report it. If you think it's suspicious, Defender for Office customers are able to do that now, report it within teams. And, you should probably try to simulate some sort of attack if you have some sort of attack simulation for Teams messages. Now, for the Microsoft side, natively, attack simulation for Teams is still in private preview, but it is definitely coming. We know that it is something that customers are looking at and they want to educate their users. So that is coming. But I'm not sure about the other education platforms like CoFence or whatnot if they have that built in, but I'm sure others are trying to spin that up as well. And then finally, there is a zero hour automatic purge or zap for Teams. That works for internal messages and external messages is on the roadmap. But what zap is, if you are unfamiliar with it, is post delivery protection. So if something is delivered and our threat intelligence determines that that message or email is malicious after the fact, and it's already gone through, it will automatically zap it and purge it, delete it, quarantine it from the user so that they never see it. So it's a, it's a service that is built in. And like I said, for Teams, for Exchange, it's been around for a long time. That is part of the exchange service for uh, Defender for Office. But if you're a Teams, it's for internal messages only right now, but external is on the roadmap and coming. Have you received a message from an external user in Teams recently? It's been a while. I'd have to look <laughs> at my messages to see. Okay, I get a lot of them. Okay. And there's been a recent 
user interface change to where when you first receive a message from an external user, you get a full page modal dialogue where it does not show any of the chats from the external user. And it says basically in the middle of the screen, this is an external user. Don't click on stuff. Don't respond. Don't do anything if you don't trust this person. Do you want to proceed and even see the messages? Yes or no? Simplifying and putting in my own words the message. But it is uh, definitely adds an additional step where it does force you to stop and think before you do anything in that chat. Um, and it's anytime it's a, a person you have not interacted with before, you get that full screen modal dialogue that actually obfuscates all of the chat messages they've sent you until you accept them. So I think that's helpful as well. And I was thinking that would actually be great for email, except email is it's much more common to get stuff external. So it would be like yeah. an extra click all of the time. But in Teams now, that's the default behavior um, is that that. So if you're not seeing that yet, it's probably coming to your tenant soon. You know, we always get things first in, in the Microsoft tenant and test stuff out before our customers get their hands on it. But that also will help with all this user, user education you're talking about, Andy, where it you cannot even see what the external person has said until you click through it. So I think that's a really nice uh, user interface addition and makes it very obvious that you are interacting with someone outside the company. Yeah, for some reason as well, I feel like if I were to get a Teams message from an external user that I have never interacted with, it would automatically just be deleted. I. I would not interact with anyone on Teams. It feels much more personal and more intrusive in my day when I get a Teams message versus an email. First, you know, it just seems that way. It's like maybe the difference between a text and a call. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone calls me and I'm I'm busy, I just let it ring and go to voicemail. If it's important, I'll go and listen to it on my own time. But if it's a text, I have to like look at it and see it. And if it's from an unknown number for me, I just automatically delete it. Well, for a lot of these people that I've like emailed with them and now they're messaging me on teams for the first time. It's just, they initiated the conversation. So there have been some that I've literally never talked to before. I, I, a lot of Microsoft partners want to talk to me apparently right now um, because it's almost Microsoft's fourth quarter and that's a whole other conversation. But uh, a lot of them are like, we've been talking back and forth in email and they're just like, Hey, I just wanted to ping you on teams. It was easier but I still get that same experience. So, Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good thing is, is all I'm saying. And so that helps with our user education efforts here in Teams is that Teams does force you to click through before you can even see it now. It definitely depends on your job, right? Like I think in your <laughs> position, you probably get more external folks that are pinging you. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't get hardly any. In fact, I think the last person, if I'm thinking back to the last person who actually pinged me on Teams, that was external was friend of the show Howard <laughs> from Ascent who paid me exactly with what you're thinking is, is they're trying to figure out what we're doing with fourth quarter and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So it was yep. partner with Ascent. So let's step back for a minute and just take a look at the bigger picture here because what I've said is phishing in teams is no different than phishing in email. And so if you're configured correctly with a tool like Defender for Office, the risk is here that an external user will send a phishing link that is malicious, that the user actually clicks on, and that Defender for Office or whatever API tool or smart screen or endpoint protection that you have doesn't catch it or think it's malicious. So what happens then? Maybe it redirects it to a payload that gets downloaded, which is pretty rare these days but can happen. And then you're back to your endpoint protection, hoping that it'll catch it. Either it's a malicious hash or you catch it on execution where there's heuristics and it deems that it's malicious behavior that's modifying kernel level files or ransomware or something like that, right? So you're hoping that your endpoint protection will catch that. And that's why we have layers of protection here. Let's say it was not a payload. Let's say it's redirecting to a phishing page, right? And now your credentials have to get entered. Well, let's hope you have MFA configured. And so that user will have to MFA. Or if you're on a managed machine, 
and that's a conditional access requirement, then the login won't work either if they capture their credentials, right? So let's say they get redirected to a page and it's, you know, a key logger or something like that. So now they have their credentials. What can they do with that if you require MFA, if you require managed machines? Not a whole lot. Of course, we've talked about, you know, what if they proxy it to another machine and they're using something like Evil Jinx and they steal a session token. Again, pretty rare, usually targeted, but managed machines would help with that because if they try to reuse that session token on a machine that's not managed, then that'll stop it. Hardware tokens as well, because you'll need, you know, uh, the actual hardware. And then detections for token replay, which of course, like is after the fact where they've already tried to attempt it, but it's still good, right? Mm -hmm. So again, there's a lot of these different protections, no different than anything that we've talked about. But I think the biggest thing here is a lot of security teams get so focused in on a new threat and they're like, well, what if this happens? Are we protected against this? Is external user chat phishing a thing? And is it a risk? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are there foolproof mitigations against it? No, there are not. But is it any different than phishing through email? It's not. It's it's really the same. And if you're doing the things that are protecting you against phishing and email, then the things that you might get through teams should be protected as well. And if you want, you know, have some sort of KQL query where you can search for that and see if, you know, you want to spend some energy going down that path. But honestly, I think you'd be spinning your wheels and there's probably other low hanging fruit that you could be doing information protection, sensitivity labels, requiring saws and paws for your admins, fish resistant MFA. You know, are you doing all those things? Like if all those things are already done, I mean, this is a very, very small risk in my opinion. I, I think the one gap here in protection versus email based phishing for many orgs is going to be that URL protection and file protection in teams. The thing is, those exist, they're affordable, and it's something you can turn on with just a few clicks, and you may already own. And you can get it through Microsoft. There are third parties that do it as well. Andy mentioned a few earlier in the show. That is the one thing you do need to get equivalent security, because I think almost any org worth their salt today does have zero-day protection for files attached to email, and they do have time-of-click protection for URLs in email. And so I think for some organizations, their concern is we don't have equivalent protections on Teams chat. The thing is they are available. Once you have them in place, then to Andy's point, as opposed to spinning up a whole bunch of alerting, which could mostly be noise, and it's to me questionable what your investigative flow would even be if an alert were generated. What we talk about so much on this show is opportunity cost. All of that effort is opportunity cost towards implementing steps that deliver meaningful, powerful security. And we'll get on our soapbox for the nine billionth time. Andy said it over and over, managed machines. If you are not requiring managed machines to do practically everything in your environment, I cannot think of a more powerful mitigating step you can take today than that because it breaks token theft. It breaks phishing. It breaks all sorts of things that become practically impossible to do short of very targeted attacks. And so if you're not doing that, you need to get there. And that's by doing things like full mobile device management, co-management for your Windows PCs, Mac management for your Mac OS devices, and then requiring and just checking for that compliance state when they sign into stuff. This is not rocket science. And when you're, when you're focused on like, let's generate alerts and let's go do investigations on this stuff, like, is that scalable? Is it meaningful? Are you going to get the results you expect from it when there's other stronger mitigations you can take? So yes, do implement URL protection and file protection in Teams, which also gets it for you in SharePoint, OneDrive, Office documents as well, which is awesome. And then zoom out see the forest from the trees, 
and think of what steps you're taking overall to harden your environment instead of maybe chasing down the, the current threat of the day. Because we all read these security focused websites, or at least your security team does, and then they like to fire off like rabbits to go chase, rabbit holes to dive down. And sometimes that's valuable. We want to make sure we're protected against this threat or that threat. And I know Teams phishing has been in the news right now. And like Andy said, is it a real threat? Yes. Is it completely mitigatable? Is that even a word? No, <laughs> it's not. But again, it's, it's looking big picture. If we're taking the right steps to protect against phishing exercises overall, we probably have the protections in place here too. So where can we spend our effort in the ways that we get the most bang for our, your buck? And that's really what the message we wanted to land in tonight's show. Yeah, and, and one final point, because I think this is actually important. Adam and I, we talk about this all the time. I missed over this bullet point from our notes, but when you talk about phishing, what is the actual like vector, right? Traditionally, it has been credentials. It directs you to a site where your credentials are phished. And so what's the most important thing that Adam and I harp on when we talk about credentials? A lot of times it is how you're implementing your single sign-on configuration for your machines. We talked about managed machines. Okay, so you have managed machines, but also when your users are signing into different federated applications or having their daily work done, are they getting prompted for credentials? Are they getting prompted for MFA? They shouldn't be if you've done it correctly. However, the service and the conditions on the back end should be satisfied based on your managed machines and how those are configured. If it's hybrid mm -hmm. Azure AD join or hybrid Entra ID join or Entra ID join, Entra federated applications are automatically single signed on. So you never have to enter in a credential. So a red flag, if I click on a link, and it redirects me to a site and it says, please enter in your credentials. That would be an automatic red flag for me in my daily work. Automatic. I would pause right away and be like, I don't even know what my credentials are. I have to look them up. Same thing with MFA. We've talked about this as well, where Microsoft does implement MFA for specific sensitive apps that have to be re-authenticated with MFA, send that MFA token again. But for the most part, I never have to enter in MFA for the majority of apps because I'm coming from a managed machine that I sign in with Windows Hello for Business or some other method that already sends the MFA claim to the conditional access policy. That way, I don't have to continually get my phone and re-enter the MFA. So think about how you're implementing those services, what the daily user experience is like, and how they would pause and think when something is out of place. Because for me, clicking on a link, going to a site where it's asking for my credentials immediately is a red flag and I would never enter in my credentials. You couldn't fish me that way, ever. That's, that's a really good point because I just had a conversation. This was not with a customer. It was kind of a colleague of a friend situation. Not unlike what spun up this conversation, Andy. I think this was a, a, fr a direct friend. Um, and I was talking to the, this security engineering person who um, was running like the most stereotypical playbook you could possibly imagine. They were an Okta AWS Proofpoint CrowdStrike shop, like literally all the things. And this person even like casually dropped how they don't like how Microsoft doesn't prompt people to authenticate enough because I'm a security person and I know the way you have more security is you make people authenticate more often. And I, I didn't have time to address like all of the things I disagreed with, with this person. Um, but that mindset is still out there. And Andy, you just very eloquently explained why that is an anti-pattern, why that's not actually more secure. Because as I often talk about, what you're really doing is training your users like the lab rat that hits the button to get the food pellet. Oh, I get prompted for authentication, regurgitate information out my keyboard into the PC without thinking about it. And you're right. I started thinking as you were describing it, and we've talked about it on this show over and over, and I know it's kind of boring, but our benefits site. I know that's the one site that's going to make me pick up my phone and do number matching. But otherwise, 
I still didn't get prompted for my username and password like ever. Like I, again, like I would be flabbergasted if something said, yo, enter your username and password. I, I'd be like, first off, what is my password? I don't know it. But even then, like I would completely stop and pause and go, is this legit? Cause I don't, this doesn't smell right. And outside of that one predictable app that asks for reauthentication, which I think is smart, nothing does ever. And so anything that would, I'd click a weird link from a weird person and all of a sudden it wants this, like, what the heck? And that is the power in not prompting because when a prompt comes up, it does flag that, wait a minute, something's not right. And that is really, really powerful. So I love how you, you really told the story there on why we so often talk about don't prompt your users all the time. It's not more secure. In fact, it just helps set them up to respond to phishing. And that's a really good example of what would happen. And that's our show. I really enjoyed talking about this because it was a real world example. And I think a lot of people can benefit from listening to how we think about the protections in general and, and how this is a real threat. But if you have these protections in place, it's really no different than any other security threat. So when something pops up in the news, don't jump right away because <laughs> if you're doing the things, you probably are protected unless it's some newfangled thing. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed talking about this. Hopefully you guys learned something. We'll have all the links in our show notes. By the way, thank you to some of the listeners who reached out to us telling us that our show notes were broken in our YouTube <laughs> videos. That has been fixed. I've gone back and fixed all the links. So you should be able to see them and we'll keep a close eye on that in the future. Mm -hmm. Our contact information will be in the show notes as well, working. So if you have any questions or comments, topics you want us to talk about in the future, just email us. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week.